torn between two worlds, two fates, two women. Shakespeare. Never heard of you. I have a play. Of any quality? I think so. You can't just make up words. Someone must. Money. Power. Greatness. You see, it's all just theatre. Theatres must be destroyed once and for all. The danger is real. I am no coward. Nor was the man executed yesterday. You plan to write a play about the most dangerous man in England? Better to die on our feet than live on our knees. You all have created a place where a common man can become a king. The time has come for us to fight for what we believe in. We are at war. And our only weapons are words. I will write plays that question how we love, why we fight, what is human. Who knows what secrets lie within men's souls. Let's keep it going for Lori, everybody. Thank you very much. The bard is in the building. I keep on wanting to say like good morrow to you or something, but I'm just gonna say welcome, welcome to Build. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's great to be here. So you play William Shakespeare in Will, an origin story about you know, the world's most famous playwright. But what's interesting is so little is known about this historical figure, um, which kind of gives this series endless possibilities. So what was it like playing someone that we don't actually know that much about? Exactly, I mean, the only thing I really had to go on was this guy's plays. Like you said, so little is known, everything was burnt in the fire of London. What we do have is, you know, 50 plays and 150 sonnets. And from there, I was like, well, what kind of guy is this? He's, he's someone who understands love, he understands people. Um, and what, 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 I, what we really wanted to focus on was who was this guy before he wrote all these plays? Everyone knows William Shakespeare as arguably the greatest writer of all time, but he started somewhere where he'd written no plays. He was a glove maker. He was in relative poverty. So we really wanted to create someone that was believable and just a regular guy at the beginning of his journey. And you do such a good job at that. You really capture that sort of like young, starving artist so well. And you have to tune into the show because it's this like bloody, dirty, colorful world um, that is so uh, mesmerizing to watch. Um, what attracts you to Shakespeare's plays? You were saying sort of coming, uh, kind of going over his plays is how you got to know him. Is there, are there things that stand out to you? Well, I think what makes him unique is that unlike his contemporaries, he wasn't university educated. He was a glove maker. Um, and so he, he approached plays and theater and his art from a much more grounded place. Um, theaters in those days, you had to write plays that connected with everyone. You had uh, the penny paying groundlings as they were called, like you, you poor people that could only afford the pit and they were the most interesting, um, and it got more expensive as you went up. So Shakespeare had to write plays that could connect with every single one of these people. Um, and I think that's what's so interesting about him. And, and, and for me, where I kind of understood and why we, uh, we were similar when I was starting out was that I was entering a totally new world. I mean, I, for any of you know, this is my first job straight out of drama school. I was brand new. That's, let's just pause there. That is amazing. <laughs> like, can we give it up for that? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So he's entering this world that he doesn't know that much about, and he's trying to make it. And he's, you know, there's so many people around the corner waiting to shoot him down. Um, I, I, fortunately, everyone's been really lovely to me. Um, but yeah, I, I, certainly 
making your way into uh, a world where you have people like Christopher Marlowe who have dominated the theater world um, and he's brushing shoulders with his heroes. Um, that was my in, and, and when Shakespeare first comes to London, he sees Shoreditch London, this crazy rock and roll melting pot. The, the, the thing that was the most familiar for me was that my first time in New York City, um, getting off the subway and just the energy and vibrancy of the place is, was electrifying. And I think that's what it would have been like for Shakespeare, just a, a total, you know, overload of the senses and for any artist to draw upon that is so exciting yeah hopefully we treat you a little better in this city because you have kind of a rough go at it at the start um but i want to get to sort of how you got cast in this role i mean sort of the actor's dream to go to school so you were graduating and this popped up how did how did you get involved so i i wasn't graduating i was in my i was in my final year oh. i just um i was I just finished doing A Winter's Tale, oddly enough, um, where I was playing Antigonus, the guy who gets chased by the bear, you know, that famous line, exit pursued by bear, that was me. Um, and I, I went up for this role um, for actually a different film, and the casting director saw me and said, it's for a young William Shakespeare, and I was like, that's crazy. Um, and I met Shaker and Craig, and yeah, I mean, we went in the room and Shake is this really mysterious man, does not look, doesn't say a lot. And I was terrified. And obviously, you know, I, I, I knew Craig's work as well. Um, but they were so lovely and, and, and really brought, a, you know, allowed me to play. Um, and that has carried through for the whole filming process. They've been so great at, at letting someone with such little experience as myself really have the freedom to play and explore this incredible part. Well, watching you, you would never know that this is sort of a first for you. Um, and it seems like everyone could really formed a strong community on set because you were filming in Wales and this huge town that they built for you. So what was the first day like for you on set? So well, just before that, just to touch on what you said, it was really important for them to get the sense of a theater company. These guys live with each other. They are such a tight-knit community. Um, and so we had two weeks of rehearsals where the theater company could really get to know each other and just play around so that when you're on set, they really, really know each other. Um, and that was amazing. Um, but on set, the atmosphere is incredible. Like we have, you know, I've, I've made friends for life and we have, we have a WhatsApp group where we all talk to each other and, <laughs> Um, I felt like I was in such safe hands, but also the people around me, cast, crew, were so experienced, and I just wanted to be like a sponge and just soak up the wealth of knowledge that was on set. You know, there are so many ways that you could go with sort of a young Shakespeare um, take, and what I love about this is that it's just like filled with the brim with creativity, and whether it's the costumes or the way that you guys use language, um, it's such a pleasure to watch because you never really, the, the choices are so bold, so you never know what's going to kind of come next. Were you surprised that this was the direction that they were taking sort of, a, sort of a Shakespeare origin story? I think looking at Craig's other work, I think he's, he, he, well, that's part of his style is, and with him working with Baz, they take something from a certain period and make it relevant and, and, and have a currency that modern audience can understand. And I think that's what excited me about it. So many people are put off by Shakespeare and I think to really connect with a modern audience, you have to make it relevant and exciting um, because people have this misconception that the Elizabethans were really stuffy and well-behaved and actually they really weren't. We are, we are tame compared to these guys now. They slept with who they wanted. Um, you know, men or women, they had a, just a different idea. It was only when Queen Victoria came along and everyone, you know, shut themselves indoors. Um, and the soundtrack, the costume, really gives you an idea of what it would be like to be a poet in that time, because it would have been like being a rock star. Yeah, I was saying earlier that it's sort of this David Bowie vibe that I love, and um, that's so fun to watch. And, you know, speaking of sort of updating this material for a modern audience, there's a really fun scene in the pilot uh, where you sort of have a rap off, poet off, verse off with um, a guy who's kind of stepping up to you and yeah. sort of challenging you. 
Um, and I believe we have a little bit of a clip of that um, just to, for a treat for you guys. So we're gonna go to a clip and then we can talk about it a little bit more. No wit is so stale, worms would not eat it. It cannot be spoken, only excreted. <laughs> oh, I dare well, for thou art truly dead. For shame, thy wit is slain by one so poorly read. Oh, he ills! Bring a stool so this knave can sit. Quilled by common will shall be his epithet. <laughs> Upstart has offended. Think on this, I pray. All's mended. Whether fine feathered ooh, or the most common of birds, to wing our way to heaven, all we need are words. Well, I think you definitely won. <laughs> What was it like filming that? Because, um, you know, Shakespeare obviously has such a way with language, um, but to sort of say that dialogue aloud in that tense exchange, what was that like? Yeah, so uh, Shakespeare was really keen that these words were not pre-rehearsed and that they were coming to him, that it was uh, inspiration, that they were, he had the ability to uh, speak verse off, off the cuff, just like in an actual rap battle. Um, he actually asked me to watch um, Straight Out of Compton and, uh, and also A Mile just to get that, the way that they use words as weapons um, to really pin people. Um, and it was, that was one of the most fun scenes to film, actually. We shot it for a whole day. Um, and uh, Bruce, the guy who was, who I was filming with, just, we just had a lot of fun just trying, to, just trying to rip each other, really, and get one up and, and just play, yeah. I was reading somewhere also that you found inspiration in Hamilton um, and the way kind of words are used there as well, because that reminds me a little bit of the cadence and the rhythm um, from that show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as the series progresses as well, you, 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 we, we see that Will is able to use his work in a more political sense for, uh, for, a, for a power that is beyond just his own means. Um, and I think for any artist, we never get to pursue that to, 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 for our words and our work and our art to mean something more than just for success. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's always the ultimate and Will really kind of selflessly realizes that, that his work can mean something greater to a higher, higher power, yeah. Yeah, that, that does come across, and sort of the phrase that's repeated in the opening episodes is about holding up a mirror to nature and how Shakespeare's work really says something about the society that these people are living in. What do you think the importance of kind of bringing Shakespeare into this current moment is? Um, well, I think the, the, why it's always relevant is that Shakespeare, like I said, wrote plays for everyone. He... He was, he was working in a time where he had to censor what he wrote. And the way he got his message across, he had to be very, very careful. I mean, he, he in our story, you know, Shakespeare's a Catholic man trying to write plays in a Protestant world. So he has to be extremely careful. Um, and, and, and the power of the word that, that he can convey messages to the masses and at the same time be held accountable for those words. So it's incredibly dangerous. And I think... Art will, will always, since the ancient Greeks, have a place in, in politics. You know, and something that feels so modern to me about uh, this show is sort of how the notions of gender and sexuality are really in flux. Um, I talked to your co-star, um, Olivia, who plays Alice early today, and she's someone who's really finding ways to succeed in a society that tells her she has to be a mother, she has to be a wife. Um, and what I like about this show, it really pushes those boundaries. Um, so what was that like to sort of play with these um, concepts in a sort of uh, time period in the 16th century, but that feels very current and relevant now? Yeah, I mean, really fun. And, and, and like I said, that those people were much more open than we are now to to sexuality um to sometimes adultery um and and i think there's a freedom and a and a, and a fun 
in, and I, which I really relished in getting to be in that, that world where see, Richard Burbage say, says it, they live fast, die young, and leave a pox ridden corpse. Life was short, and they really wore their hearts on their sleeves and, and to, a, to an extent, did what they wanted. And I think that's appealing and, and to anyone and, and in a modern audience where we are quite constricted in the way we live our lives. That, that was something really fun to play. You know, and you mentioned Christopher Marlowe earlier and he's sort of this rival playwright that has a really huge influence on you, but he's also sort of openly queer um, in this world and you know, has male lovers and orgies and every, you know, anything you can expect. And you two develop a certain bond connection, there's a chemistry there. Um, what was it like to explore that? Because we know so little about Shakespeare that his sexuality has often been up for debate. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I mean, it wasn't too difficult because Jamie Campbell is a gorgeous man. <laughs> Those cheekbones. I know, right? Um, and it's certainly something that we haven't explored fully yet, but certainly when we were filming those first scenes, there's a, an energy between the two of them, and whether that is sexual chemistry or just purely um, an appreciation of, of talent and interest. Um, but lots of people believe Shakespeare was sexually, he was, he was discovering his sexuality. People think there was a, a male lover, and I'd be really excited in the scope for season two if that, something like that would happen. Um, and yeah, Jamie was incredible to act across. Um, and he brought this, he sums up the Elizabethan period and Will sees a freedom in him that he, he hopes in his own life. Will's been married since he was 18. He's had three kids. He's kind of lost that, those years of being a young devil may care Casanova. Um, he's had that responsibility. And Christopher Marlowe really sums up just someone who is doing what the hell they want and, 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 and has no ties. And for, for Marlowe, he sees in Will the innocence that he's lost. He's become jaded in this industry. Um, you know, he's had, enough, he's had thousands of people telling him how amazing he is and throwing themselves at him. And I think he, it saddens him and he sees a young version of himself, green and innocent in Will. So they both kind of want what the other one has. Yes, I'm very intrigued to see how that all plays out because... It's not yeah. up to me if, if, <laughs> Will, if Will is bisexual, unfortunately. Um, you know, and you also develop such a strong bond immediately um, with Olivia's character, uh, Alice. And I was talking to her about your, how your connection sort of gives us Romeo and Juliet vibes because throughout the show you're writing various plays and we'll get a quote here and a quote there. And I had to do, I was like on Google while I was watching because like, you know, I'm not a Shakespeare scholar. Um, so what was, talk about uh, your relationship with Alice. Yeah, so I think when, when Will turns up in London, he has no plans to have an affair. I think he's, he's just exploring his art and his career, but he suddenly dis he finds his people. You know, he finds all these like-minded artistic people who he can have a conversation, an artistic conversation with. He's never met anyone like Alice Burbage. Um, his wife, Anne, certainly isn't like that. She doesn't believe that he even has what it takes to be a great writer. And he, he discovers something which they can share work. And, and it's so unique when, when you can find someone who you can connect with both on an artistic level, on a friendship, and, and on an attraction. And I think he just gets caught up in the whole world of London and the, and the theater. And it's, it's like any great holiday romance. You fall in love with the place, you fall in love with the girl, and then often it's hard to separate those things. Yeah, I love how, you know, the writing in the show is really seen as collaborative. And there's a scene where you two kind of stay up all night writing the two gentlemen of Verona. And, um, you know, there's all these theories whether Shakespeare is just one person or multiple people. And I thought it was a really kind of bold choice to offer up the possibility that there's like a woman's hand in these plays that have now become canon, um, which I thought was a really interesting direction. Yeah, because if she was writing them herself with her name, no one would read them. Ex yeah, exactly. So she is able, with Will, to be able to 
have some outlet for that artistry that she clearly has. And so they, they develop a very strong bond, both artistically and a romantic level. Well, before we go to audience Q&A, Olivia actually had a little bit of a question for you. She wanted to know something about a video that you sent in a text thread. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, <laughs> OK, so yeah, this was a, uh, we have a WhatsApp group with our, our cast. Um, and we were filming in Wales, and I hadn't seen my girlfriend in a long time. And I, I sent her a, a little like cutesy message, like talking in, like, baby talk like that's you know as people do and you just never want anyone to see that stuff and it, I sent it to the entire cast um yeah it was one of those moments and I was just about to do a really serious scene and my whatsapp goes and it was um Shane Zaza who's like the joker of our cast who plays Autolycus doing an impression of my video and I just di realized what happened. I just died inside. I was like, just, just put me in a hole and take me away somewhere far. Um, but me and my girlfriend had a good laugh about it. And yeah, I had to just wear it. There's nothing you can do in those situations. It's like, yep, that was me. There's no way out of it. I'm a, I'm a big softie. <laughs> Seems like you guys are having a really great time behind the scenes. Yeah, we really did. I mean, amazing cast. And you, you always hear about casts really getting on but genuinely not a single bad egg. Everyone was so lovely, yeah. Well, I believe we have some questions for you. Let's start over here. Hi, Hi. so uh, I was just wondering if you had like a favorite um, Shakespearean like insult that, you, that you've like either, that just from like a particular scene or anything, because obviously they're interesting insults. I, I don't know about uh, from a particular scene, but cream face loon, I always, I always <laughs> like. Um, he's got so many, we don't even, we, like, you're just looking at it, so many of our words are his. But yeah, that's one of my favorites. I like that. Hey, Laurie. I was just wondering, based on your research, how much did he play the role of the director in his productions? Because it's, it's known that everybody was on the same level and there wasn't really a director, which is hard to think of right now. So I was just wondering what you... Research. Absolutely, you're totally right. There, there wasn't really a directorial figure. Um, the actors collaborated with each other. Um, what we know is that Shakespeare wasn't that good an actor, um, but it was sometimes appeared in small parts in his plays. Um, but yeah, it was great to just see it from that other side. And, and, and I think it's always hard for a writer to let their plays go and, and let their actors just get on with it. And I think that's, that's the struggle that Shakespeare has, especially with um, Kemp, who is who just wants to improvise all the time, like in a serious speech. He just wants to take his trousers down and get his willy out in front of the audience. <laughs> um, and Shakespeare's like, you're ruining my beautiful words. Um, yeah, that's, that's one, kind of one of the things. He's definitely one of my favorite characters, Ken. He is amazing. <laughs> and Will Houston, who plays him again, is a lovely guy. And someone who is, he was, he was one of the guys who was quite a good mentor for me as well. We got one more. Hi. Hi. So you mentioned you were doing some theater, and then this is sort of your breakout television role. I was wondering what type of roles or what type of acting maybe you'd like to do in the future. Great question. I mean, yeah, all my training pretty much was, was theatrical. I've grown up watching plays and, and falling in love with the theater. Actors like Mark Rylance and you know, the Royal Shakespeare Company and some amazing directors. Um, I think for me, there's no real one role. I just... I'd, I love getting a chance to do parts where you really change people's perceptions and people don't, wouldn't expect you to play it and you really get a chance to transform. Um, I think that's the real fun of it. We only get one life and we have to live behind these set of eyes. And as an actor, you get to go behind a totally different set of values and, and, and see the world from a different place. Um, so just anything that's really different to me, I love. Well, you pull it off here. It's a total transformation. And everyone needs to catch Will July 10th on TNT. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. This was so great. Thanks for having me. Cheers.